Here at the center, we have a ritual that we love to do. We've been doing it for years, and we call it lighting the flames of oneness. And I want to invite Judy up here. And, I, and while she's coming up, you know, Judy is one of our dedicated practitioners. Judy has been greeting us at that door every Sunday for weeks and months and years on end. And I'd love to just give her an acknowledgement right now for being so committed to that experience because, you know, that is the first, that is the first space, the first energy we come into is, is Judy and, it, and it's a beautiful one. So Judy is going to be our candle lighter today. So we are an interfaith gathering, we are a spiritual community, and we honor all teachings and all spiritual teachers. So we're going to begin this ceremony that celebrates this oneness of life and acknowledges that all peoples and all faiths come from the one universal presence, which we call spirit. And so let us begin. And we start with the Tao. The Tao honoring the universal path of harmony and equilibrium, the natural way. Next, we honor shamanic traditions, honoring the beliefs and practices of all indigenous peoples. How blessed are we that we live on a land of the indigenous peoples? also known as the way of pristine spirituality. Hinduism, honoring the path of knowledge, action, and devotion. Judaism, honoring the ethical path of living by sacred law. Buddhism, honoring the four noble truths and the path of compassion. Christianity, honoring the Christ consciousness as the path of love. Islam, honoring the path of submission to the will of God as the highest calling. New thought, honoring the metaphysical path of mental healing through the practice of universal spiritual practices. And we save the last candle as our healing candle of love. And this is the opportunity for you to participate in this ritual, in the stillness of your heart and mind, to bring to awareness the names of anyone you wish to be included in this healing flame of love and light. And perhaps it is your own name. Now that our flames of faith are fully lit, we move forward into our celebration, realizing and reaffirming with this ritual that all paths lead to God. Thank you so much, Judy. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's always wonderful to be with you in this way. And today I want to talk to you about the power of spiritual practices. Now, I'm pretty sure all of us in varying degrees already has a sense of the power of spiritual practices, but I thought it was a good idea to delve back into it this week. The last time I was here with you in this way, I talked about the power of the science and mind and spirit philosophy. How, you know, a hundred years and counting, this spiritual philosophy is still working, it's still applicable, and it can still handle the changes of our evolution. And we are in some massive change for sure right now. And I thought this was a good follow-up to that talk because within the philosophy, we have some core pillars. And certainly our spiritual practices are a massive and important part of what we believe. So before we get into this, the practices, and before we talk about the power and the benefits of those practices, I want to answer the question, what is a spiritual practice? A spiritual practice is a set of activities or actions done on a regular basis with the intention of furthering your spiritual development and growth. 
deepening your connection to God or source or divine energy or whatever your word is, and for spiritual attunement. I love that word, attunement. As soon as I read that, I saw a car being taken to a garage to be tuned up. We tune up our technical devices, and yet sometimes we forget to tune ourselves up. And so spiritual practices do just that. It's a spiritual tune-up. Committing to developing a spiritual practice attunes your ear to the voice of the divine. It tunes your ear to hear from the invisible realm. It fosters spiritual discernment. That's a real thing. I can't say I really understood that when I first started on the path and first came into this philosophy. I didn't even know maybe what the word discernment meant. But now I truly understand what spiritual discernment means. And for me, spiritual discernment is that opportunity to take whatever I'm going through or whatever somebody else is going through and put it through that spiritual lens and allow my spiritual consciousness and awareness to discern the matter in ways different perhaps than my own human experience. People also feel a stronger sense of belonging and purpose for living. That's a big one. Purpose for living once they maintain a regular spiritual practice. And I think we're also at a time where we are craving a deeper meaning to our lives and we are seeking a, a deeper connection, not just with ourselves and our own source, but with each other. So let's take a look at some of the spiritual practices that are common today. And this is why I so love and respect Ernest Holmes. He knew. He knew because he was a mystic, and he knew because he was an intuitive, and he knew because he was a visionary. And what did he know? He knew that a philosophy like ours, which is based on spiritual laws and universal truths and principles, could withstand growth. He always said, stay open at the top. So our list of spiritual practices today is a modern one that includes the ancient practices, but also some of the newer ones that have infiltrated our everyday living. So I want to start with the core ones for this philosophy. The first one is meditation. And I always like to say meditation is simply the practice of sitting still with yourself and your mind. It's not about controlling your thoughts or stopping your thoughts. You really can't do that. You do meditation long enough, that's a byproduct of sitting with yourself in a still and quiet way for periods of time. But mostly it's the practice of sitting still. And in today's world where we are constantly stimulated, that's really hard to do. It's really challenging to do. So I always like to say to people, start with 60 seconds. You know, if you get to 60 minutes, that's great. But just start somewhere. I'd rather, I'd rather do a few minutes multiple times a day than do one long period of, it, of meditation. All right? The second, and so meditation is really the communion that we have with, with the presence, with our own presence, our own spirit, our own soul. Then you have visioning, which we also offer. Visioning is very powerful because vision is listening to that intelligence that knows all because it is all. We believe you can talk to God, to spirit, to source. And so in visioning, you actually pose questions and then you listen. And I loved when Michael Beckwith taught me about visioning because he did this thing where he went like that. He's like, you know, it's as if someone's whispering and you're leaning in to hear what they say. That's always stuck with me. And I really feel that's a, a perfect uh, symbolism of what visioning is. We are, we are listening. In prayer, we are speaking the word. In prayer, we are participating in the creative process. In prayer, we are acknowledging that in the beginning was the word, was the vibration of voice, and that we have power in that voice. And that also includes affirmations as a spiritual practice, which really is the third, uh, the third part of prayer, which we call realization. And there are things called breath work. 
How many people have been involved in breath work or have tried breath work, right? They had a massive meditation of breath work here a couple of years ago. Wim Hof became very popular uh, during the lockdown with his breath work. Breathing is so powerful. You know, breathing is the one thing, the one bodily function we have control over. Pretty much everything else is happening automatically. That's why I always say, Things are starting to get jacked up. You're starting to feel a little stress, a little anxiety. Take a breath. It literally communicates to the brain that there's no, there's no charging elephant. Yoga, spiritual practice, chanting, been going on for thousands of years, spiritual practice. Qigong, spiritual practice. Rituals, spiritual practice. Reiki spiritual practice watching Gaia TV or sacred readings that's a spiritual practice in fact one of Ernest Holmes most favorite spiritual practices and I love it myself was contemplation is contemplation and for me whereas meditation is being with the presence and visioning is listening to the presence and prayer is speaking the presence to me contemplation is the exchange I just love, I mean, Ernest would sit in his library for hours contemplating, thinking, not with his own mind, but that divine mind, having that back and forth, questioning the meaning of life and his own place in it. Contemplation is a powerful spiritual practice. Fasting is a spiritual practice. And look at now, all the craze around intermittent fasting and the benefit that it, it does for our body. I would encourage us to spiritualize intermittent fasting. I know that when I go on my seven day juice program, wow, it is a spiritual experience. I do have a heightened sense of awareness. My intuition does become very, very acute. So all of these are spiritual practices and maybe there's one that you have that I haven't even named. Okay. The point is, is let's get beyond what our limited thinking and I don't say limited by judgment. I just mean limited because we've been hearing it for so long. Let's get beyond what we think spiritual practices are and take a look at what might be true for us. And we're going to talk a little bit about that as we wrap up our time together today. So here's a six point summary of, of some of the benefits and the power of spiritual practices. Decreases in cigarette smoking, alcohol use, drug use, and acts of aggression. Increases in health maintenance behaviors. In other words, we more consistently make better choices for our health. Lower mortality rates. More effective coping with terminal illnesses. Inner peace and lower stress, right? Sign me up. <laughs> and this one was really fascinating and true. Increased size and strength of social groups. And the first thing that came to mind when I saw that last night was yoga in the park, right? We have these incredible gatherings where there's 100 plus people down at the park strip doing yoga together, amplifying the power of yoga as a group. And, and this information is coming from the Institute of Transformational Nutrition. So let's get a little bit more into some of these specifics. Longevity. Studies have shown, studies have shown, and, uh, or rather studies have linked spiritual practices with longevity. This association is possibly due to decreased levels of interleukin, which is a messenger protein that drives chronic inflammation. We're going to talk a little bit about that in just a moment. So keep that in your mind. A study of 1,700 older adults demonstrated that those who attended church or a spiritual service were half as likely to have elevated levels of this protein that controls inflammation. Acceptance and non-judgment, two vital ingredients of healthy weight loss. And that's the next topic, weight loss, spiritual practices, influences, weight loss. Acceptance and non-judgment to vital ingredients of healthy weight loss come with a deep and abiding sense of spirituality. When individuals strive towards spiritual growth, they begin to see themselves and others as divine. As a result, they respect and care for their bodies, 
more fully. That is an absolute truth for me. I was in separation to my body when I got on the path and started my practitioner studies. It was quite a moment to understand the divine nature of my body. I had a sense of it, but along that journey, I had a very deep and profound realization that my body is made up of stardust, that there is an intelligence backed by love that has created this, this mechanism that handles all of its affairs so that I might have this experience. And that, that was a game changer for me. In addition, in addition rather, vibrational frequency. And you hear me talk about that a lot. We're all talking about that a lot. We love that new phrase, vibrational frequency. Why? Because we're pure energy. We are frequency, right? We are frequency. It is is increased through spiritual practices, which may further stimulate weight loss. It's also been found that higher vibrational frequencies are related to positivity, which is also fundamental in weight loss, being positive, having faith in yourself and seeing your body as a holy temple. Decreased risk of illness. Because spiritual practices may improve coping mechanisms, social support and values, they can significantly decrease stress levels. Stress tends to suppress immune system function. That's why they say stress kills. It's a real thing which can leave the body susceptible to illness. Anything that decreases stress, such as spiritual practices, will likely also reduce the risk of illness. Coping and quality of life. In general, people with spiritual beliefs and practices tend to have a more positive outlook on life. How many people would agree with that for yourself, right? More life satisfaction, increased happiness, less pain, more meaningful experiences, greater goal fulfillment, and good quality of life, even in the midst of crisis. Now, confession time. I have fallen off the spiritual practices bandwagon many times over the last 35 years. And I've swung to the extremes, right? I meditated for an hour every day for 100 days, pierced the veil, had a transformational experience that was so profound, I wrote a book about it. And I've gone to not meditating at all. During the pandemic and the lockdown of the loss of my mother, I couldn't close my eyes because I was seeing flashes that were traumatic for me and I couldn't do it. And I gave myself permission not to do it. Fortunately, there were other practices I participated in, but at that time, meditation was not one of them. The same with prayer. I certainly pray every day now, but I've just come out of a crisis that I shared a little bit about last time I spoke about how I went through a crisis of faith around prayer because my mom died and I didn't understand how so many people could be praying for an outcome and it not happen. So I abandoned prayer and that was appropriate because I had to go through a process of reconsidering, reevaluating, evaluating, uh, reorganizing my relationship to these practices. So wherever you are, it's absolutely appropriate because that's where you are and you're appropriate, right? So just be okay with where you're at here. There's no shame, there's no judgment. It just is. A few other things. Recovery. Spirituality may aid in the recovery from surgery or illness. Heart transplant patients who attended religious activities were more likely to comply with follow-up care. Super interesting. Were more likely to comply with follow-up care. They also had higher self-esteem, lower anxiety, fewer health worries, and improved physical functioning 12 months after surgery. In addition, several studies have confirmed that lower stress levels speed wound healing. You see the connection here? The mind-body connection? You've all had a version of this. I know you have. And these studies are so powerful because they reinforce our personal experience that these practices affect the collective. Depression and anxiety. Studies have found that individuals suffering from depression have found spirituality to be an extremely important depression care technique. 
Let's take that phrase out the door with us today. Depression care technique, and I would add to it, strategies. Can you imagine a world, I can, in the new design for living, I can imagine a world where a prescription includes meditation. Ernest said, a pill and a prayer. He didn't say just a pill, and he didn't say just a prayer. He said a pill and a prayer. Imagine going to a doctor's appointment with depression or mental health issues or physical ailments and having them write spiritual practices as part of your prescription. See, that's why the world is changing. That's why this quote unquote collapse, the word that everybody is using, is happening. Because we need to create a world in which these things which we believe in and have personal validation of are part of our everyday living. That's the power of what is changing. So we can make room for the new way. Chronic disease, when stress is not handled with healthy, healthy coping mechanisms, it can lead to immune dysfunction and chronic inflammation. We go back to that protein that regulates inflammation. So spiritual practices regulates the protein that regulates inflammation. Why is that important? Because we know that long lasting inflammation is the root cause. I firmly believe that personally with my own experience that inflammation is the root cause of all disease. Can you imagine that spiritual practices can have an effect on the level of inflammation that we experience? That's powerful. And of course, cancer. The big C. In one study that asked cancer patients how they coped with their diagnosis, 93% cited spiritual beliefs and practices, and 42% said they became more spiritual after the diagnosis. How many people know somebody who had a life-changing illness diagnosis and they became, quote unquote, more, more spiritual? Yeah, myself included. It, it, it's a byproduct of experiencing the limitations or the seeming limitations of your body, of your material life, to go towards the spiritual life, the substance that makes it all up. Inner peace and tranquility. Spiritual practice provides a sanctuary admit, amidst the chaos of daily life. Now let me tell you something, by the time I'm done with an eight hour day at the restaurant with hundreds of people crossing my path and intermingling with my energy field, I am running towards quiet and solitude. It's like taking a shower. Like I, I have to get quiet as a, as a way for all of it to pass through me and for me to find that centered place again that's not influenced by the person who didn't like the way their eggs were scrambled, right? Which certainly happens. Offers a space for individuals to find solace and retreat from the pressures and stresses of the external world. Regular practice cultivates a sense of inner peace and tranquility, enabling individuals to navigate challenges with a greater sense of calm. It doesn't say eliminates the challenges for those who are involved in spiritual practices. It says helps us with our spiritual practices. Emotional and mental well-being. Spiritual practices support emotional and mental well-being by offering tools to manage stress, anxiety, and depression. Meditation and mindfulness practices, for instance, allows individuals to observe their thoughts that's the first phase. Of, first phase of meditation is getting past being so fidgety, right? And just getting to a place of being able to be still in the silence. The second part is the observation of your thoughts. Like, oh my gosh, wow, who's thinking these thoughts? It's just crazy, right? And then it allows you to be in a place of choice as a result of the awareness that you have. Do I want to do that same thing that I've done all these years? yielding the same result or do I want to make a different choice? Self-reflection and personal growth. Spiritual practice encourages self-reflection and introspection. Anybody going through self-reflection and introspection these days? I don't know a person that is not actively involved in introspection right now. It's so powerful 
That is a really good spiritual practice to be participating in now because we've gone through and are going through change. We're not the same people. We, I am not the same person I was last year, let alone last month. I am changing on a daily basis. So it's really important to be gentle with yourself if you're going through introspection, if you're feeling like everything is turned upside down, because it is for good reason. We are revisiting, reconsidering, reorganizing, restructuring every aspect of life, starting with our values, what we believe, who we believe we are, what is our purpose in the world, big questions for an important time for sure. Expanded consciousness and perspective. Spiritual practice expands consciousness and broadens our perspective on life. Wow. That is a good thing. You know, we have our teaching symbol. It starts with the, you know, the seed goes into the soil and comes out the plant. The outer world that we live in, that's the plant. That's the world of effects. That's why I always say be mindful of how much of that you're taking in in the form of news and headlines and, you know, gossip and low vibration conversations. That'll wear you down. What we're seeking is a higher understanding, a greater, more expansive understanding of what this all is. And when you participate in spiritual practices, you literally take a step back from the world of effects. It gives you a chance to breathe, to relax, to go, whoa, wait a second, what's happening here? Do I want to get caught up in all of that? Or do I want to create my own trajectory? How can you do that? With things like spiritual practices, more time for the self. I grew up in a world where selfishness was not a high value. It was wrong to be self-focused and self-centered. Not today. I can't imagine a more important thing than spending time with myself, getting myself congruent in body, mind, word, action, spirit, all of it, so that I can be a better human being when I'm out in the world. Through meditation, prayer, and other practices, individuals tap into a deeper sense of awareness and interconnectedness. You know, when I really got oneness, that blew my mind and my heart for a very long time. I'm still kind of in awe of the interconnectedness of all life. That's why this uh, separation that we have been uh, witnessing and sometimes are involved in, you know why that doesn't work for us? Because it's not the truth of who we are. It's not the truth of who we are. Back behind all of this, we all come from the same source. The same manufacturer is spitting out each and every one of us. We're all made from the same stuff. That's going to be the thing that moves us into the age of Aquarius, the new earth, or just a better tomorrow. You have such power with what you know. You are so important right now. Don't look around. It's you if you want it to be. You know, just putting that spiritual practice mask on yourself, wow. Going out the door and being that vibration, praying in the car on your way to work, blessing everyone, that is the moment we are in right now. And each and every one of us has the opportunity to be an agent of change. And it's not that hard to do. This expanded consciousness helps to dissolve the illusion of separateness and fosters a profound understanding of the interdependentness of all beings. We're seeing that with Mother Nature. Like seriously, do you think that you can keep dumping on something that's alive and not at some point have it be challenged or have it be um, in pain? Look how disconnected we are to Mother Earth. You know, I didn't read the Bible, but I know that idea of having dominion over. It didn't mean having control over and, and abusing and using without care. It meant that we had a responsibility. We had dominion over the land and all of its inhabitants. And lastly, transcendence of the ego, ego, ego and attachment. Spiritual practices offer a means to transcend the ego, the limited sense of self that often governs our thoughts 
and actions. Man, that's a spiritual practice right there. All day, all day long, I am going, wow, <laughs> who's thinking that thought? You know, I'll find myself in a thought of separation about somebody before I'm even aware that it, that it was happening. And I'm just like, wait, what? And I come right back to center because I don't want to think that way about people. I don't want to talk that way about people anymore. By cultivating detachment from material possessions and external outcomes, individuals can experience a greater sense of freedom and liberation. This detachment allows for a more authentic and aligned way of living, focusing on what truly matters and reducing the grip of attachment. This is what I said when I was here in June. I still have clothing from like 15 years ago because my mind says, oh, keep it, you, 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 you. gone, be gone, you know? Because the, the, giving away your possessions, giving away your clothes, those are good places to start, you know? Before you get into letting go and surrendering to how people don't act the way you want them to act or they're not saying the things you want them to say or the world is not conforming to the way you think it should be operating. It's definitely a process. So I want to leave you with a couple of questions to consider because I think it's a good day to just wipe the slate clean and come back to some of these core questions that maybe can help you redesign your spiritual practices today. And the first one is, what are my intentions for developing a spiritual practice? My intentions today are different than they were. My intention today for my spiritual practices is I want to be in touch with the most knowing part of myself. I want to be able to tap into that intelligence effortlessly when I need to so that I am guided to right action. I also am using my spiritual practices as a preparation for physical death. Because to the degree that I can become more and more comfortable in the invisible realm, detached from the presence of my body, I hope the more prepared I'll be for that last practice. We'll see. Number two, what am I willing to explore? I had that long list. Did your mind go, oh, no, 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 no. Okay, yeah, maybe, no, no. But really, why not? We've got all these happening in town. Why not try a, a, a chanting class? You could just go online. And, and find people who are doing that uh, on Facebook. Um, Deva, uh, Deva Prima, I think, and Mitra, or husband and wife team that are doing that, if I'm getting their names right. What are you willing to explore? Are you willing to engage in a new sacred spiritual practice? We have the full moon coming up on the, on the first. Ritual is a spiritual practice. Maybe you could just start there. Maybe you could light a candle, hit a chime, and bring yourself into alignment with the cycle of the cosmos. Start somewhere. Three, how much time am I willing to devote? This is a good one. And I want to add able to, right? We don't want to shame people or ourselves into spiritual practices. Like for a really long time, I believed, because it's what I saw and kind of heard, that it is the morning. It's always the morning, the morning, the morning, the morning. Well, the problem is I'm not a morning person. I come alive at night when everybody's asleep, I'm wide awake, I'm getting my downloads, and that's where it happens. So guess what? I don't really meditate in the morning. I usually meditate at night. I pray every morning. So be willing to look at the reality of your life. Because what happens is the mind goes, well, they want us to meditate in the morning, but you gotta be at work at six o'clock. I'm not getting up at five o'clock to meditate, so we're not gonna do it, no. Be real with what your schedule is, be real with your personal and work schedule, and build something around that that works for you. And if you're a morning person, great. If you're an evening person, great. I love the religions that are doing it three, four, five times a day. Smart. Absolutely. Important to take those breaks. That is for sure. How do I want to start my day? And number five, how do I want to end my day? Some people have the spiritual practice of journaling, gratitude journal where they want to go to bed with the vibration of gratitude for all that they experienced in their day. Do you want to end your day with a divine ritual, lighting of a candle, hitting of the chime? I mean, these are ancient symbolisms, 
Just lighting a candle takes you back thousands of years and connects you with your ancestors and the people of this land. Just getting a chime and, and hitting that echoes the, the, the ritual for me, certainly of mass and, and, and going to that sacred experience, which I still stay very connected to, the rituals of my Catholic upbringing. So be open and try different things and see what might be true for you. The point is, is I want to encourage you to create your own spiritual practice. If you want to talk more about this, I'm certainly available. I'm sure any of the practitioners or Reverend Don is available. Maybe there's somebody here that you hang out with and the two of you could help each other design a spiritual practice. It's needed. It's needed now more than ever because the mind, that's why the, the wonderful uh, quote for the day, the soul knows. The soul craves for this like air. You know, the heart craves for this, like food and water, to be still and to be in ritual. And the challenge, of course, is to silence the mind that's always pushing back, always pushing back. For about four months now, I have been trying to maintain a regular spiritual practice of going to the gym. And I will not give up on this. Have I achieved it yet? No. I did for two weeks, then it didn't, then I did. But I am so interested now in why I can't then I'm not going to give up on it until I do. I'm not beating myself up about it. It's not like a thing, but I am very mindful. And I had to look at my schedule and go, okay, that day it's not happening. I've got, you know, and I, I found the times when more times than not, I'm going to be able to make it in the gym. Then I set myself up for success. The gym bag is in the car. It is right there in the front seat, always reminding me, remember what you said, you go into the gym. And as many of you know, I changed my story about going to the gym so that that could be a spiritual practice that I have more and more often in my everyday living. I never went to the gym. I hated the gym. I wasn't a gym person, let alone a runner. Now I'm at the gym running on the treadmill. Honestly, I don't know who that person is. No, I do know who that person is. That person is my future self. That, for, that person, that Camille is my future self. The one that ran on the treadmill yesterday for 18 minutes. That's not the past, Camille. That's my future self, and I'm literally running towards her. And that's what I would like you to consider today. How might your practices help you walk towards the you that is seeking to emerge to be available for the change that we are going through right now? So let's take the deep and profound divine breath. And let's just feel into the atmosphere of the room. I, I, can you feel it? It's, there's a very high vibration of, of awareness right now in this room. And maybe even in your room where you are at home, watching. That's the pure energy that I'm speaking about that is awake, aware, and alive. It goes by many names, but it is the one that knows all because it is all. And our practices commune with that one that knows all because it is all. We recognize that this is a presence. It is love itself. It is an intelligence. It is awake. It is aware. It is alive. It is responding directly to us and it is responsive to us. It is the grain of sand. It is the mountaintop. Something created all the planets. Something put all the planets and is holding all the planets in place. Something threw together stars in actual figures that we can see when we look skyward. This is an intelligence, a playful intelligence, no less. And so today we identify ourselves with this presence, with this source of love and with this intelligence and we open our minds and we open our hearts and we say, yes, we call upon the presence, our own souls to show us the way, what practices are doable for us today. If not daily, what can we regularly participate in? Being mindful of our mind's resistance, we breathe into that. We bring compassion to that mind and we still say yes. And so today collectively we are experiencing the spiritual practice of prayer. 
where we are rearranging our thinking with intention on that which is truthful, that which is positive, powerful, and more in alignment with what we want to feel. How do you want to feel? I invite you to speak that word out right now. How do you want to feel? And feel the vibration that's associated with that word for yourself and whomever it is that you are holding in your heart right now. People who are experiencing health challenges, financial challenges, economic challenges, relationship challenges, for all of the citizens and peoples of the city that are dealing with homelessness right now. Are we blessing them as we drive by a row of tents on Spinard Road? Or are we allowing our mind to pass judgment and being in a default reaction of separation? No judgment, just observation. Because in that moment of observation, we can change. We can bless them knowing that we are the same as them. Oneness is the answer. And so I release this prayer with gratitude, knowing that like any seed, we have planted it now firmly in the divine mind, that soil that has everything necessary for this word to blossom into truth. We understand the creative process that we are aligning ourselves with. We understand that we are a part of that creative process right now with this spoken word that like a pebble in a pond ripples out now, touches and affects all of us here, all of those watching, all of this community beyond these walls, everyone, everywhere. And we are so grateful for the awareness of this truth. We are so grateful to be in this truth. We are so grateful to live this truth right here and right now. And we acknowledge this by saying together, and so, so it is. is.